thank you for just an opportunity to gather together and worship you, to gather and receive from you, to, to lift up our voices, to lift up our, our even the time that we sacrifice coming this morning, but that you come bearing gifts, Lord God, that you come, Lord, to meet us, to bless us, just to spend this time with you, Lord God. We I pray that we uh, just walk out here blessed, changed, that we would receive all that you have for us this morning. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so, Happy New Year. Uh, entering a new year. And the one thing that I guess the Lord's kind of put in my heart uh, recently is that, you know, God, He makes things new. You know, He's always making new things. He's always doing new things. And I guess a lot of us, like, you know, just... I don't know if it's because we just get comfortable, but we always expect the same thing. And it's like, it's another year, you know, another of the usual, another day, the same routine, another week. And we fall into that mode. But, you know, you see God, I mean, he's, he's different. I mean, he's supernatural and he's always doing new things. And it's up to us if we're going to get on board with that, you know, and be receptive to the new things that he has for us. I mean, because with the new things comes new blessings. It comes with a, a new growth, with a, a, a new range of influence that we have on people. And um, I just praise God for that. Um, now, before we get into the Word, I just um, want to bring up, like, just a, an appreciation for the Word of God. Um, you know, because there was a time um, where people would gather together like us, come to church, and then the priest, you know, and the minister, or the minister would stand up and would read the word to them, but it was in a language that they couldn't even understand. And then they would go and they would tell them what this means or, you know, what, what it means and what they need to do. And a lot of people abused that, you know. I mean, this was, you know, back in the 15, 1400s and stuff. And, you know, there was, the people were ignorant of what the Bible said, and it, was, it wasn't their fault. It wasn't translated in their language. And now, today, you know, due to a lot of the sacrifice that men did and, uh, you know, and women, they, they gave their lives to translate the Word of God into the language that we can understand it. And a lot of times we take it for granted. I mean, just having the Bible, I mean, now how many translations are there in English? I mean, there's like so many that we can find. But I mean, even just having it understandable in our language, guys sacrificed their lives. They were burned at the stake. They were martyred. They were killed for doing these things, um, and I mean, there's a whole lot to it, in the history of it, um, but I just want to appreciate God's word, that we can even gather together, and read the word of God, and understand it for what it says, because in the word of God, there is power, and I think that's kind of like, um, inevitable, in the fact that Satan tried to keep the church from understanding his word, they tried to keep <coughs> us from knowing what God has to say, you know, I mean, it's okay for us to gather together and talk about other things, but when it comes to the Word of God, you see, the Word of God is living and it's powerful, That's right. Amen. you know, it changes us, it empowers us, it encourages us, it transforms us, Amen. it is a great, miraculous thing, the Word of God, and for us to be able to gather together like this in the morning and, and, and receive the Word and hear it together and be encouraged is a tremendous blessing, so I just praise the Lord for that. We're going to be starting um, in Hebrews chapter 3. You guys have your Bibles? And, uh, okay. Okay. Right. Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to be reading uh, chapters 3 and 4. Um, and there's going to be a focus on the rest um, that's going to be offered um, in the scriptures. Um, you see, these two uh, chapters, they uh, correlate a lot with uh, the way the uh, Israelites were brought out of Egypt into the Promised Land. And comparing that with our Christian walk today, um, you know, we can learn a lot, you know, in the way that, you know, because a lot of times we wonder, well, how God is, His character. Um, a lot of times our, our the way we see God or the way we think of God is based on what people have told us about God. You know, our grandparents, our parents, um, at church. Uh, people that we love, they, they, they tell us, oh, well, God's like this, you know, or, well, God's like that. And so we just grow up learning, oh, well, this is how God is. Um, but you see, we learn a lot of seeing the history and the way that God was with the Israelites and the things that he spoke to them and the things that he spoke to his prophets. And um, in these two chapters, it kind of uh, gives us a picture of what God was doing with, um, 
you know, with the Israelites and bringing them out of Egypt into the, into the promised land. Um, um, I, I'll go ahead and start reading. Um, it just meanwhile it gets um, put up there. Um, so starting on verse 1, it says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose, son, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So right there it's just saying, you know, Moses, um, this man that... Um, the author is speaking to uh, he, to Jewish people, and they had a lot of respect for Moses. Um, you know, like a lot of us, we idolize people. You know, we we tend to uh, raise up men and say, you know, this man was a, man, a great man. You know, Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther, in doing the uh, the whole like revolt of the, uh, the with the Catholic Church, and you know, just different people that we respect. And these people had a lot of esteem for Moses. And he says, you know, you should right, you know rightfully respect him, but more so Christ who was also faithful to the calling that God gave him, he received even more honor and glory than Moses, even though Christ was a man, because he was not only the house that God built, but he was also the builder of the house. He was a creator. Um, and just so to more honor be given to Christ. Okay. Um, so okay, the next slide. Okay, so it says, um, verse 7, Therefore, you know, after saying these things, it says, As the Holy Spirit says, Today... If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And it's referring to the Israelites when they were brought into the, into the wilderness. You see, God had displayed His miracles. He had, he had parted the Red Sea before them. He had promised them that, they would, that He would be with them. And He did these great things, but yet they rebelled in their hearts towards God when they heard you know, the Word. Um, what did they do when Moses left for a while to uh, receive the commandments from God and to go hear from God? They turned from God and they said, You know what? God left us out here to die. Let's go ahead and rise up idols. They started worshiping the idols that they had learned from Egypt. And they start, you know, and and they were they were doing detestable things um, against God, and so it was just like, you know, God saw this and he was he was angered, he was hurt, you know, that they turned away so quickly from him. And he's saying today, therefore, when you hear the word of God, do not harden your hearts, you know, because that same rebellion that was with them is still to, today in our world, and it's something that um, is just kind of pointing out here, uh, verse twelve. Um, Starts with beware, brethren. brethren. Yeah. Okay. okay, so it says, verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Okay, um, right there, I mean, it's just the importance of encouraging one another. You know, lest there be an evil heart um, of unbelief in departing from the living God. A lot of times, you know, we there's a lot of us here that have been serving God for more than 10 years, some of us more than 20 years and 30 years and plus. And, you know, every day, you know, we get up and, and we serve God and, and we, you know, continue in our walk. But yet, you know, do we take time to encourage one another? Um, you know, because just because we're in Christ doesn't mean we've already, you know, come to the end. You know, we still need to be encouraged one another in the faith. We can't take it for granted and say, well, Pastor Carl's been walking with the Lord for so long. He's been a pastor of these churches. He's all right. He's good with God. No, I mean, we I mean, we should take that time to allow the Spirit of God to give us words of encouragement. You know, I mean, we spend so much time talking about the weather, talking about the football game, talking about how, you know. I mean, really, like, 
I think we know how the weather is. You know, you go outside and okay. <laughs> it has been windy. You're right. Uh, but I mean, you know, take some time to just, you know, impart these words of, of truth, you know, these words of power that, that can encourage us, you know, to get closer to God. Because, you know, it might be like a, just a simple, hey, man, just want to remind you God loves you. And that's simple. But yet that person goes home that night and remembers that word and it encourages them to keep on going. We never know. We never know what we're going through. And so in our up times is a time to, to, to have extra to give to others, you know, encourage one another. Amen. So it's just saying, you know, encourage another one another, lest that um, part of unbelief, you know, causes somebody to go astray. It says, 14, um, for we have become partakers, oh yeah, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, holding steadfast to the end um, our confidence in Christ it says verse 15 while it is said today if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion verse 16 for who having heard who having heard rebelled indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses verse 17 now with whom was he angry 40 years was it not those who sinned whose corpses fell in the wilderness and to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in, be, in because of unbelief. Okay, verse 19 again. So we see that they could not enter in, right, enter into the rest because of unbelief. So, okay, so God gave them a promise, right? And what was the promise? To enter into the promised land, right? And it's referring here um, to entering into his rest, right? That, that was the promise that God gave and it's, why did not why did they not enter into that rest according to what we just read because of unbelief so was it god who kept them out of the promised land and caused them to wander 40 years in the wilderness you see god's intentions were good god's will for them was to bless them god's will was to bring them out of slavery out of egypt go through the wilderness maybe 2 to 3 weeks trip and make it into the promised land and be blessed, flowing with a with a land flowing with milk and honey, you know, to where they would not only just live in peace, but they would conquer, that they would be a respected nation, that, that God would put his name on this nation and say, these are my people, and that the people of the world would see that and respect that. God wanted much for them. He wanted to bless them. His intentions were good. His intentions were to bless, that they would enter into his rest. But yet they did not enter, and they will, they wandered the, the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Because of their unbelief. Their unbelief. God, I mean, I think this is, I, I couldn't understand God's heart, and I wouldn't be able to, and we wouldn't be able to really understand his anger or his sorrow. But, I mean, to imagine that, you know, he wants so much for these, these Israelites. You know, he wants to bless them so much, but yet because of their hardness of their heart, they're unable to receive it. I mean, as a parent, you know, um, oh, I'm not a parent, but as a parent, you know, you, <laughs> you make promises to your kids, right? And, and they're good promises. You want to bless your children, and you say, look, if you make it here, you know, you're going to have this. You know, you, you're going to be blessed. You're gonna, and when they rebel and say, you know what, I, I do what I want. I don't want to listen to you. And, I mean, I mean, what, I mean, doesn't that frustrate you? You're like, come on, man, I want what's good for you. I want to bless you. I want to help you. And the kid's like, ah, you don't, you don't know what's good for me or whatever, you know? And so it's like, in the same way, I mean, God's anger was turned. Like, man, don't you see that I want to bless you? It is no different today than it was back then. You see, God's intentions towards us are always to bless. Amen. He does not teach us lessons by getting us sick. He does not teach us lessons by putting us through hardships and, and doing things in our life just so that we'll learn our lesson. You see, His intentions are to bless us, right? But what happened, because of our unbelief, because all of us have sinned against God, all of us have rebelled against Him, just like the Israelites and said, I know you want to bless me, I know you want to do these things, but I'd rather live my own way, right? And we were put in that state of not entering into that rest, entering into His will. But yet God made a way, Amen. right? So we're going to go into that in uh, chapter 4, um, starting with therefore. There you go. Therefore, since a, promise of, since a promise 
remains. Okay, so this promise isn't over yet. It didn't end with the Israelites. It says that this promise, it remains. Entering his rest. Let us fear, or let us be careful, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Oh, let's not miss out on it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it, it was uh, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. We who have believed do enter that rest. And that's worth saying again. We who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For we, he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Okay, so it's referring back to when God created the earth. After six days of working and creating, seventh day he rested. Okay, and he's, the, the rest is the same thing. Verse 6, it says, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and, though, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter again because of disobedience, because of unbelief. They did not enter it. Again, he designates a certain day saying in David, today, after such a long time as it, as it has been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Okay, Joshua... Okay, um, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. So it's referring back to Joshua. Joshua was the one that after Moses, because Moses didn't get to step into the promised land. He didn't get to enter into that rest that God had promised, right? Um, <clears throat> but Joshua was a man that followed after him that took the Israelites into the promised land. Joshua was the one that, that you know, God used to accomplish this. But it says that it didn't stop there. You know, it says that's why... Um, if Joshua had given them this rest, then God would not have spoken it through David in the Psalms afterward. You know, because after that, then God again <laughs> prophesied and he spoke about a day of rest. So it wasn't, it didn't end there. It's still active. It's um, verse 10. For he who has entered his rest has himself also seized from his works as, God's, as God did from his. Man, doesn't that sound refreshing? For he who has entered his rest, God's rest, has himself also seized from his works as God did from his. Verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent. Right? Diligent. What is diligent? You know? Diligent. Putting your heart into it. Putting your faith into it. But putting your all into it. Be diligent. What are you diligent about? You know? In your life, you think about it. What are you diligent about? You know, so everybody has different things. Let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same examples of disobedience. Verse 12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You see, um, and this scripture right here, we often like use it, and, and it's rightfully used in talking about the Bible, but right here specifically, in talking about the promise that God spoke, the word that God is speaking. Because it says, again, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So it's saying if you hear his voice, if you hear his word, he's saying the word of God, it's not just a command, it's not just a suggestion, it's not just something that we can take and say, okay, that's a good idea, let me do it. It says the word of God is living. And it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God, it, it divides between the intentions and the thoughts in our heart. It, it opens up, you know, our, our inner um, intents. And verse 13, it says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Okay. Uh, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, 
but was in all points tempted um, as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the good news part of the message. This is the good news part of this word that, that the author was sharing. You know, because unbelief, disobedience, you know, we, we, we find ourselves in it, you know, we don't believe God or we disobey. And, and what does that leave us? It leaves us out in the cold. You know, what can I do? How can I change? I'm the same way I was five years. What's today any different? I'm going to be the same, right? But it says that we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses because Jesus, he was tempted in the same areas that we were tempted on this earth. He stood as our priest. The priest, as we know, was the person that would stand between God the Father and the people. And as we know, um, in the time of Moses in Egypt, um, God had given special instructions to how the priests were to be dressed up and also the way the temple was to be built. And the priests, they wore costly robes. They were, they were gold and a lot of costly um, jewels. And they were dressed with a lot of like honor. And this is the way the priests were dressed. This is the way that God had instituted it. And you see, Jesus was the high priest. You know, he was, he was dressed in this royalty that God had given him. And not only, did, not only did it stop at that, but he was even the son, the perfect son of God. But yet, as priest, he laid aside his priesthood. He laid aside his sonship. He laid aside his royalty, right? To sympathize with our weaknesses, to take on our infirmities, so that we, through Christ, could enter the rest. So that through his obedience, our disobedience might be forgiven. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Verse, uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, talking about Jesus and what he was going to This was written about three to 400 years before Jesus came to the earth, and it was a prophecy about what he was going to do. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. The scriptures that we were reading about, and it was talking about entering into the rest. A lot of times, you know, we live in this life and we take up anxiety, we take up stress, we take up concerns to where it, and sometimes it can even consume a person, to where all they think about is in fear, all they think about is in worry. Everything, it's in um, insecurity. It's in these things. And you just carry it everywhere you go. Everything that somebody tells you is filtered through your mind. So if somebody comes to me and says, Hey, uh, you're a wonderful guy, man. I appreciate you. But if I'm over here with these thoughts of insecurity, you know, these thoughts of hurt, these thoughts of, of, of you know, all these bad thoughts, when I hear that, you would be like, what does this guy want out of me? What's he trying to do? Is he trying to hurt me again like the way that person did, you know, so much time ago? That's just an example of the way our minds, they filter the things that we go through in life. Yeah. And this goes for people that are saved um, also, you know, in walking with the Lord. There's a rest that God promises that we can enter. There's a rest that we can have today. A rest in, in having peace with God <clears throat> and the way that we ha can have that peace it says because Jesus took the chastisement for our peace you know anytime that we were ever hurt anytime that we ever went through a stressful moment because you see a lot of times fear what it can do is it can paralyze us you know and if we go through a situation in life that you know causes us to just become super stressed out it can traumatize us and we can carry it on for the rest of our lives. And maybe doctors, you know, uh, can teach us how to cope with it. You know, a lot of times that's what psychiatrists, you know, do, or with taking certain medications, you can cope with it, and you can live a life dealing with this thing. But you see, Jesus, man, he didn't just come give us a remedy. 
He didn't just come and say, you know what, I know you got all these things, but let me help you get through it. No, he says, let me take that upon myself. Amen. He took the chastisement. He took the hurt. He took the pain. He took the stress. He took all those things upon himself that we might have his perfect peace upon us. Amen. You know, the word of God refers to him as the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Here, let, let's go on to the next one. And then um, <laughs> in Matthew, it says, then indeed, that house is deserving. Um, it, Jesus is talking to his disciples about going and ministering to the different houses. He goes, as you go from, from town to town ministering the gospel, if you enter into a house and that house is deserving, let, um, let come upon it your peace. And in the Amplified Version, it says, that is freedom from all the distresses that are experienced as a result of sin. But it is, if it is not deserving, let your peace return to you. He's saying when you go and enter into a home, let your peace rest upon it. But what is peace right here according to the Amplified? It says it, that is it's freedom from all the distresses that are experienced as a result of sin. You see, a lot, I mean, the way that life works is that you reap what you sow, right? We, we do bad things, bad things come to us. And it says... Um, all the experience, all the distresses that are experienced as a result of sin, really we deserve a lot of distresses because of our sin. Even in the, as our walking in Christ, you know, being lazy, uh, being apathetic, being, you know, all these things, um, angry, you know, we, we go through all these sins and we really deserve a lot of distresses. But you see, the peace of God, it goes above that not only forgives our sin and says, you know what, before God you're right, but it cleanses us of those distresses Amen. by the grace of God. Amen. Because you see, if it wasn't so, then the work of Christ would not be complete. Amen. Because what would be the point of Jesus taking our chastisement? What would be the point of Jesus taking all of our ridicule? What would be the point of Jesus taking all that upon him on the cross if we were still going to have to pay for it here on earth? Because it says that he, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. It's an exchange. Don't believe the lies of Satan. Don't believe the lies of this world that say that you have to live in the way that you're living. That say that you have to pay for the sins that you've done. That say that you have to live this way. Because no. Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives. Amen. He came to proclaim peace to us. Amen. Um, and so, and not only that, but in this scripture, it shows them how we can impart peace to others. It says when you enter a home, let your peace come upon it. And when you're walking around, you're walking with the peace of God, but you have to believe it. You have to receive it. You have to know it. And when you walk, you know you have something to offer people. Not just words of advice, not just friendly encouragement, not just a smile. You have the peace of God ready to impart and ready to um, to offer people. Uh, let's, let's go to the next. And then um, Philippians 4, 6-8, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, because the peace of God is not just something that we can have and something that's an option that's enjoyable. The peace of God is necessary to live for God. We can live a Christian life, you know, and, and, and serve God and, and, you know, go through it and yet not have that perfect peace living on us. We can still do it worrying every day about our children, worrying every day about what's going to happen, worrying every day about what these people are going to think of me, worrying every day about where am I going to go in 10 years from now, worrying about our finances, <laughs> worrying about all these things that come to us. But there's a peace which surpasses all understanding that God said that, would guard our hearts and our minds. It protects 
our hearts and our minds. You see, and because we have to remember, we live in a world with an adversary, and his constant um, desire is to attack. He's always attacking. And that's why we need a guard. You see, the guard, it acts as a, as a prison guard. It acts as, as somebody who said, yeah, you're not here. You can't mess with this, with this heart. You can't mess with this mind. That's the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. And it says, how do we, how do we have that peace? It says, by making our requests known to God in thanksgiving and believing. Making your requests known to God. It's one thing to carry our concerns. You know, sometimes we think, well, you know, we all have our worries. We all have our, our cross to bear. You know, we all have these things. And we just carry them and say, well, just suck it up and keep going. But no, it says, cast your cares upon the Lord. Uh, can you please go to the next one? Um, okay, well, yeah, there's a, a verse after this one. It says, um, to cast all our cares upon him, for he cares for us. Um, all your stresses, all your worries, it says make your requests, make them known to God. You know, even when you're driving to work or driving home, make your requests known to God. And say, look, Lord, these are my requests. This is, this is what's going on with me in thanksgiving. And God will give you peace in knowing that he hears your prayers and he's going to act on your behalf. Um, this next verse, it says, Jesus was talking to his disciples. And this was after a time, um, you know, Jesus had just finished rebuking these people that were that were um, rebelling against God and speaking things against Jesus. And he, he was just attacked. And then after this, he pulled his disciples aside and he said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What a beautiful Savior we serve. Amen. This is the heart of the Lord that we serve. This is the heart of our Lord, of our shepherd. He's not trying to put anything hard on us. Now we got to go out and do all these things for God. And now we got to, so he's saying, wait, 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 stop. Come to me if you're heavy laden, if you're burdened. Take my yoke upon me, upon you and learn from me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, I am, for I am gentle and I am lowly at heart. He is the only one that we can truly trust with all of our heart. Jesus is gentle. He is lowly at heart. He is gentle with our hearts. He is gentle with our, with our souls if we come to him. And he says, take my yoke upon you. Take my burden upon you. You see, we have the option of to carry our burdens or to carry his burdens. Whose burdens are you going to be carrying? You know, the world's burdens are... How much money are you going to make? Who are your friends going to be? What about your reputation? What about how um, you know the safety of your kids? What about all these things and all these these burdens of being wealthy and and just trying to live our lives carrying all these weights that are never for us to hold? God says, <clears throat> look at the birds in the sky. You know, don't you see that they never you know go worried about where they're gonna what they're gonna eat what they're going to wear. You know, in the same way, how much more you being God's children will he not bless you with everything that you need, clothing, shelter, food. You know, God will supply all our needs according to his riches, according to his glory. You know, so we don't need to worry and carry these burdens and carry these, these worries. Just take my concerns. You know, take time to speak to the Lord. Come to him and say, Lord, what are your concerns? What would you want me to be concerned about? And he will put others in your heart. He will say, well, you know what? Why don't you just give this person a call and pray for them? Or why don't you do this? And, and it's something that it's not a heavy burden that we can't bear. You know, Jesus is gentle. He's meek. 
Not only that, but he says he has overcome the world. And we can come to him in his victory and live our lives according to his victory that he's already won. Amen. Um, Amen. Here, can you go to the next one? So this, this is a verse. This is casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. I think, I mean, there's a... Um, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, um, the Satan came to him, right? And he started tempting him with all these things that we are tempted with in this world. What was it that Jesus used to overcome um, with his words the temptations of Satan? What did he use to combat um, Satan, his temptations? The word? He used scripture, right? I mean, I think that's very interesting that the way the word of God, it, it, it shows that, that Jesus quoted scripture to combat, you know, the temptations of Satan. I mean, how much more should we, you know, use the Word of God? You see, because we're reading these things and it's like, oh, yeah, man, that's really good. Like, <laughs> and it's true. Like, man, it's like, wow, that's refreshing. Like, wow, that's cool. But it's like, no, I mean, that's awesome. But bury these words in your heart because these are the words of truth that are going to carry you through those storms because... Right now, it's kind of, you know, cool. Some of us might be, like, in a good time of our lives. Right now, you know, some of us are on vacation. We might be, you know, enjoying our time. Some of us might be going through a really hard time in our lives. But hold on to the words of God. You know, these are the words that he's making available to us so that we can use them to, to hold on to with all of our lives because sometimes it's going to get to that point in our lives to where we are going to need to hold on to them with everything that we got. Because when you have, you know, somebody up in front of you, you know, saying these things and you're, this is the only thing you're hearing, it's easy. But what about when you're out in the world and everyone around you is yelling the complete opposite that God's not real, he doesn't care, get with the real life, you know, that's not true. That's when, you know, push comes to shove. We're going to need to hold on to the word of God and say, no, but my word says this and my God says this. Because I'm not just sharing with you just like, good ideas or words that, you know, I think, and this is the word of God, so, you know, hold on to it dearly, you know, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you, God cares for you, he hurts to see you worry, he hurts, and he gets frustrated when he sees you distressed, because he's like, look, don't you see I'm here, don't you see I care for you, don't you see I want to be your God, don't you see I want to carry your worries, don't you see I want to carry your burdens, you're unable to carry them, you know, come to me and receive from me, and so we can take these words and, and hold on to them, um, okay, let, let's, let's go on to the next, uh, okay, and then uh, <coughs> another word says, Jesus saying to his disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as this world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Uh, it says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I think about a couple of guys in the Bible. Um, for one is uh, Stephen. Um, this guy in the early church, right after Jesus was taken up to heaven, his Holy Spirit came upon, upon the first church, and there was this guy that got up, and his name was Stephen. And, and he was, uh, you know, preaching the gospel. He was working in, in the things of the church. And there came a point where he was amongst these people that were, that were confronting him because they were like, hey, this message that you're preaching is not true. And they were, they were religious um, leaders, and, and they were ready to kill him. You know, and at this time that they were already, um, you know, coming and confronting him, he started preaching the word of God to them without fear, boldly, preaching to them the word of God, preaching to them when they were ready, right to attack him. And what did they do? They picked up stones and they started killing him. And what did he say? He looked up to heaven and he said, I see the Son of God sitting at the right hand of the Father. You know, and they got even more furious, and they finally killed him. And as they were, the last stones were being thrown, it says that he looked up to heaven, and he said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Who in their right mind would do that while getting stoned and murdered in the midst of all these people? This guy had the supernatural peace of God living in him to where nothing in this world 
Nothing the devil could throw at him, nothing any person could ever tell him or ever do to him could take that peace away to the point where he said, God, he wasn't even worried about dying. He wasn't even worried about being so. He said, God, what was he worried about? God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And who was there when that was happening? Saul. Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, who Man. wrote most of the New Testament. Man, the peace of God is powerful. The peace of God is necessary Man. for us to live for God. And it is offered to us by a generous, a generous God. The Israelites did not, not enter into the peace because God held it back from them. They did not receive the rest. They did not receive the promise because of their unbelief. But Jesus overcame sin so that through Christ we may believe. It's up to us if we're going to believe. It's up to us if we're going to trust. All he's asking you to do is believe in Christ. Put your trust in him. Look at Paul and Silas when they were um, going about preaching they cast a demon out of this girl, right? And it caused an uproar in the city because this girl was a psychic. And she would tell people, and, and, and they would make a lot of money off of her for telling all these, uh, all the future and all these things that people like to hear. And, and suddenly when that spirit was cast out of her, she was no longer able to tell the future. She was no longer able to tune into uh, spirits. <clears throat> and then Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. Now, when they were in prison, what were they doing? Could they, they could have easily been, you know, totally concerned, totally burdened with their circumstance, right? You think about it, they're in a dungeon, they're in prison. They've just been doing the works of God and they ended up getting persecuted and, and in prison. But what did they do instead? They lifted up songs and hymns to the Lord, Amen. giving thanks to God. Amen. And the power of God fell on that place. And this man, this guard, was about to kill himself for what happened because all the cell gates were open, all the chains of the prisoners were broken, and everybody, you know, walked out, and this guy was about to kill himself, and, and then Paul's like, wait a minute, we're, we're still here, you know, it's okay. And he preached to them the gospel. Man! We need the peace of God to live through us on a daily basis for the supernatural power of God to be flowing. Because had they not been worshiping, had they not been praying, had they not been looking at God, they would have just said, okay, well, we've got another three, four days here until our sentence is up. Maybe we'll go back home. We'll, you know, do this and make our plans. No. They were not concerned. They were lifting up their voices to God. Let us do the same. Because even though we might not be in a physical prison, even though we may not be in a physical dungeon, a lot of times this world sets up prisons for us. It sets up dungeons for us and persecutions that might not be physical but are definitely emotional attacking you and you know it attacking your your character attacking your soul and putting you in a prison paralyzing you lift up your voice to god and say lord i thank you that in the midst of all these things you do not change and you remain faithful you remain good you remain trustworthy he does not waver this is the God that we need to hold on to, the God of peace. Um, here, let, let's go. I think we have one more slide. Yeah. Okay, no, that's the last one. Okay. Um, so, and just right before we close, um, I just want to offer up, like, if we could just take some time. Um, can you guys please uh, close your eyes? <coughs> And I just want you to put your focus on the Lord, like put your attention on Him as we come to Him in prayer. You know, because some of us here, I mean, including myself, you know, we've been through things in our lives that have hurt us. We've been through things that just like the Israelites, that they turn to God and we turn to God and say, God, why? Why did this happen to me? Why did you let this person hurt me? Why did you let this happen to me, Lord? Why? And we live our lives with this fear. There may have been a circumstance that was just outside of our control. 
and something happened that we just always wish we could go back and change. There are these things that happen in our lives, but what they do is they, they, they paralyze us, they, they hurt us, they rob the peace of God from our lives and from our minds. I want us to come to the Lord right now together um, in prayer with these, with just with, with your heart. And Lord, we just thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that it is your will for us to enter into your peace. It is your will for us to live in your rest. We thank you that it is your will for us, Lord God, to carry your easy yoke and your light burden. We thank you that you love us, Lord, and that you never forget us. You never forsake us. I just pray, Father God, that you would help us to learn to live and walk in your peace, believing in Christ Jesus, our rock. Not forsaking, Lord, the words that you have spoken to us. Not forsaking the gospel which was, which was preached to us. But I pray that you would teach us to live in that peace and walk in this peace, Lord God, that you offer to us. We thank you for this thing and help us not only to just walk in it, but to share it with others, to be that light, Lord God, to be peacemakers in this in this life. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Um, and, you know, right before um, Pastor, Orta, Pastor Carl to completely close, I just want to let you guys know <clears throat> that, um, you know, we have a lot to offer people, like, you know, and, and it might just be like, you know, sometimes we look at it just preaching the gospel, but there's, you know, a lot of things that that people are going through that prime them and get them ready to hear the word. I just want to encourage you guys to to be ready to share that peace, to, to share the gospel of the Lord, you know, because, you know, the world, they're still in captivity, they're still in bondage to sin, and ultimately to the wrath of God, which is coming. But we have the peace of God and the rest of assurance in knowing that when the day of judgment comes, if we have confessed and received Jesus as our Savior, we don't need to fear that day of judgment. But we can encourage others you know, to receive Christ. And God will back you up. God will be with you. And He will back up the words that you speak because God wants them saved more than you could ever. So I just want to encourage you guys with that. Um, and um, go ahead and pass it on. Stick around.